Hi, I'm Siwa Pili, Rose Amador LeBeau, and this is Data Voice TV. Welcome to our COVID-19 show. This is actually our first show that we've recorded away from the studio. We have my mask here that I just took off. We have plexiglass, we're all prepared. I have my sanitizer, hand sanitizer here, and we're gonna talk about the horrid COVID-19. So with me today is Ishdeo, because I can't say his first name, I can't roll my R's. Loretta, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Would you introduce yourself properly? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Gerardo Loera, um, also known as Ishteo within our Mexica community. Uh, I am the Director of Development and Communication for the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley. And welcome to the show. You know, the Indian Health Center has been an integral part of the community for many, many years, works closely with Conexión, where we're currently located. And um, we thought it was important to talk to the community about what we're facing as a community right now, the, uh, the social distancing, the hand sanitizer, the plexiglass that's between us, and how it's impacting our community at a, um, a much larger rate than it is at, of any other community. And I think we can talk a little bit about the reasons for that. But how is it affecting you at the Indian Health Center? Are you doing testing? What are you doing to cope yeah. with it? Um, so at the Indian Health Center, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, we responded uh, to the concerns around COVID rather quickly. Uh, we were able to establish the first drive-through testing site in uh, as far as uh, community health care clinics go here in Santa Clara County. Um, and so we've obviously had to roll back our in-person visits completely um, was our initial approach and only um, providing our services via telehealth, which could either be by phone uh, or by video conferencing. Um, since then, we have been able to open our doors again and we are doing some in-person visits um, as needed. Uh, and, and those visits, visits can take place in a variety of our departments, including our medical, dental, counseling, and even uh, a little bit deeper than that, uh, we are still providing services through our Family Resource Center uh, in the way of youth groups. Uh, we are planning a big um, youth workforce development program that's coming up shortly for ages 18 to 24. But um, how are you gonna do that one? So that's gonna actually be taking place remotely, uh, similar to the okay. way in which our kids are also participating in their classes. Uh, it'll most likely be through some video conferencing interface. Um, we're looking forward to that kicking off shortly, so I'm looking, I wanna make sure that the community knows to, to keep their eyes open for an announcement about that. In addition to that, over um, across the way uh, at our community wellness and outreach um, office, uh, where we have our gym located, uh, we're doing everything that we can to continue our services there, providing everything from nutrition classes and diabetes case management, also remotely via wow. telehealth. But um, uh, our, our fitness co coordinator, Marissa Hemstreet, um, is keeping folks fit out there by providing um, Zoom classes and PIO classes um, on a weekly basis. And so we're actually going to be transitioning that to Facebook Live um, sessions over the next four weeks, starting this Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, in addition to that, you asked about how it's affecting us. We continue to provide um, uh, testing regularly, regularly for our members and the community. Um, and there's a lot of different ways in which people can access that. Not only are we serving our current existing members um, who've already been verified to have uh, the necessary insurance, but for members or of our community who are interested in testing and may not currently be members, please reach out to us. Um, our doors are open. We're continuing to provide services to new members. You can reach out to us at 408-445-3400 uh, or check us out online at www.indianhealthcenter.org. Uh, for, for members of the community that do not have health insurance and may not qualify for health insurance, do note that we also provide our services on a sliding scale base. Uh, so essentially, uh, the cost of the services uh, is going to be based on, on your income. Now, how are you conducting the testing? Is it still drive-through? Is it by appointment only or referral only? Or how does that work? So um, what we do say to uh, members of the community who are interested in getting tested and our membership is we ask that you go through your primary care physician pr uh, first and foremost. Um, if you are not currently a member, you're welcome to reach out to us and we will walk you through those steps. 
Um, once you are put in contact with us, you will uh, most likely have some form of a visit with the primary care physician who will schedule an opportunity for you to, to get tested. Um, and the way that that looks currently at three of our four sites is uh, you're, you're, it's not necessarily drive through in that you're sitting in your car per se, but it is taking place at, at um, our, our, we have some tents set up outside and that's essentially how we're facilitating those, um, those visits. Uh, we're, we have a certain capacity uh, per day that we're able to test and so that's why we prefer folks to have a, uh, an appointment in advance. So it's your physicians that would redo the referrals to the testing on your site? Essentially, yes. And again, not to deter the community in any way, we ask you to reach out and you, you may find that that process is in flux. As, uh, as you all know, um, we're all adjusting to the current conditions. So um, that, is, that is the preferred protocol in order to establish an appointment for, for okay. testing. I do want to um, include a caveat. Uh, something important for our community to know that while we're doing our best to provide the space for folks to be tested, um, we, like many of our community-based healthcare centers, uh, partner with outside laboratories, third-party laboratories to do the processing. So the processing right now, unfortunately, because they're uh, just just overladen with the, with the need, a lot of the labs are having delays in processing. And so an example of that for um, our center, you please call and find out exactly what those wait times can look like. But on average, they could be anywhere from 10 to 14 days. And that's really important for people to know well in advance. You know, I went to Kaiser and it was about 10 days. Mm -hmm. We had testing here last Thursday. Friday, we got the results. Fantastic. The very next day, so I was very surprised. And hopefully we can do testing here monthly at Conexion because it's so important for the community. Um, a question I had was, you were talking about a lot of the, um, the Zoom, the remote um, services you have. Now, do you see that the community has access to technology? I would say that, uh, generally speaking, um, access to technology, uh, which could include um, just the use of a basic cell phone, as long as they um, have some, some form of uh, internet package or are able to even access Wi-Fi potentially um, at remote locations, even sitting out of some uh, different retail centers. Uh, we haven't seen that to be a huge problem for our community. However, there are exceptions. And so fortunately, we do have a program currently um, as in partnership with the city of San Jose. Uh, there are approximately 23 community-based organizations that are a part of this collaboration to help bridge the digital divide. Uh, being a part of that, uh, if, if, if there are folks out there, I encourage you, um, if you are experiencing difficulty establishing a broadband connection or need access to low-cost internet, uh, we can help establish that. Uh, we're happy to uh, um, facilitate a conversation with you and some of the ISPs out there, the internet service providers that are offering low cost uh, internet, Sim such as uh, Comcast has internet essentials, AT&T has a program, and there's a couple other options as well. Um, you could reach me directly specifically related to that uh, at the email address link at IHCSCV. Um, dot org and uh, I can I can help facilitate uh, connect connectivity. Now you've probably seen the um, the re the not the results but it is the results of Santa Clara County Health Department that the indigenous community has a higher rate of uh, positive cases than any other community. Um, and what do you attribute that to? Do you think it's the uh, underlying health conditions, mm. diabetes, obesity, or what do you sure. think on that? No, that's a great question, Rose, and something for us to consider. And I, and I think our numbers as indigenous people are often, um, they're, they're, they're wrapped into other labels like Latino, for instance. And so for me, when I hear Latino, I hear our brown community, indigenous community, and I think that's important for our, 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 um, our greater community to understand. Uh, you know, uh, people who are associated or labeled as Latino typically um, come from indigenous communities abroad. And so um, absolutely, our numbers, uh, we're seeing our numbers much higher than than other communities and what I would uh, attribute it to um, is essentially a lot of us live in communities where we might have um, a higher number of 
of uh, generations, multiple generations mm -hmm. living within a home, for instance. And so because we're living in, in such close proximity, um, oftentimes uh, that definitely lends itself to communicating uh, viruses, in, including the coronavirus, mm -hmm. obviously. And then at the same time, I would also attribute it to um, a lot of our people in our communities are working in, as essential workers. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't have the luxury or the privilege necessarily to um, to telecommute and work from home or and at the same time they there is some pressure as essential workers to to show up every day and so I think those are definitely some factors and you mentioned something even more important that all of us need to know myself included I I, I, I am diabetic and those of us that have underlying health conditions um, and if you look at the statistics around that our, our communities of color are suffering from those other underlying uh, health risks which increase our risk of, of COVID. So. Absolutely I think you know with a lot of the essential workers and people on the lower paying scale that can cannot afford to stay home you know and actually they are the essential workers and we look at even the south county and the people in the fields you know mm, that's right they are exposed more than anyone else because they're working and then in, in the factories and in you know a lot of places where they, they are shoulder to shoulder and they don't have the plexiglass between them and they can't work from home you know sure. um, they aren't more at risk so, and the other thing I would really encourage too is families not to socialize with anyone that doesn't live in their household, you know, because we tend to have larger families. And um, it's not okay if the person doesn't live in your house, you sure. know, because you're still at risk. Absolutely, I think that's a, a really important point. I, I just wanna say thank you to you for making all of the accommodations to make sure that we have the social distancing in place um, and, and you have the plexiglass here and obviously we have our masks and the only reason we're not wearing them at this time in consideration of the different accommodations um, is that you know in order for you all to be able to hear us a little bit better but um, absolutely encouraging folks even our own home when people come over to visit we ask them to put on their mask uh, you know people stop by unexpe unexpectedly often and we, we're maintaining our distance so thank you for reminding our community because if we all just wear our mask uh, maintain our social distance wash our hands regularly uh, use hand sanitizer like you all have provided today. We're all going to be healthier for that. Thank you for being here and stay safe. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Rose. And stay with us. We'll be right back. Wow, we're talking about COVID-19 on Native Voice TV today. And with us now is Vernon Medicine Cloud. Welcome, Vernon. Thank you, Rose. Thank you for having and, me. And uh, you're on the other side of the yes. screen here, and that's good. And we have our hand sanitizer and yep. all our goodies in front of us. How you doing? Doing good, doing good. Just uh, social distancing, washing my hands often, wearing masks at all times possible, and just staying healthy and taking care of family members. And Vernon also works at the Indian Health Center. Yes. And you're going to tell us a little bit about, I know you did some type of, uh, not a fundraiser, but trying to get uh, the, the personal protection equipment for, to send to the Navajo Nation, was it? Yes, that's correct. So we started a drive a few months ago, and the idea came from Michael Duran, who was one of our staff members at the Indian Health Center. It was his idea to say, hey, you know, he kind of put his foot forward and said, hey, let's, let's do something for Navajo Nation because they are the hardest hit nation um, right now out of all of Indian country. I was just checking the facts, and they're having cases every day, positive cases, and I think they're up about over over. 450 deaths as of today, oh August 10th. So um, that, that's a lot, you know, and a lot of those are the tribal elders who are Navajo, and it's very unfortunate. So um, they needed a lot of stuff, and we definitely sent them a lot of N95s that we had from the Indian Health Center that we got from the Indian Health Services. And we also asked the community to donate masks as well and other PPE, and the community definitely answered on that one, and we're very grateful for that opportunity. And as soon as we got the stuff, we shipped them out via FedEx, got them the next day, and they were able to use those items. Wonderful. So. Now, there's a lot of places on the reservation there and probably other places where they don't have running water. Right. And so to ask someone to, you know, wash your hands constantly and to sanitize and do all of those things that are necessary 
to avoid the virus. It's very difficult. Definitely. I believe jo uh, President Jonathan Nez, who I've been on tribal leaders calls with through IHS, there's the Indian Health Services urban Indian calls for COVID-19 and then the tribal leaders calls for COVID-19. And I've been on those tribal leader calls for since the fourth week since the pandemic mm -hmm. started and he's been on almost every single call and you know he just states the need of how Navajo Nation has a lot of needs with 30% of the reservation that doesn't have running right. water. So it's definitely a huge need. And finally, you know, some of the National Guard had came in, gave them some food and they're getting a lot of support, which is great. Uh, currently right now, the second hardest hit area is the Oklahoma City area. Oh. So um, numbers are going up in Oklahoma. Folks are getting relaxed, so to speak. Um, they're going out doing more stuff. They're doing functions and they're just not really practicing the things that they need to right now to uh, stay safe. They're not doing the social distancing they're not, you know, washing their hands as often and most definitely not wearing masks. So we, you know, just need to be vigilant about that and just do our part as individuals to combat this disease right now until we can find a vaccine. Now, in Oklahoma, are they requiring masks? I, they are, they definitely, are? yes. Okay, good. So, um, also in the news, too recently, is the Spirit Lake Nation. They had a no mask mandate uh, a few weeks back, but that changed because they've seen a spike in numbers on their reservation. And then Turtle Mountain uh, Band of Chippewa Indians, where I'm enrolled in Belcourt, North Dakota, they actually followed with the same suit and required a mask mandate on the reservations. Right. Well, I know they were having difficulty with the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, because they did they wanted people tested and they didn't want to let everybody in right and then the governor wanted them to open it up and yes. let everybody in and then this weekend or I'm, I guess it's still going on yes the um, the rally over yes, there. Yes, definitely. With the Sturgis bike rally, hasn't, right. made th hasn't made things easier. Numbers are going up. People are getting tested. Thank goodness the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe actually has shut down their, um, you know, their reservation. And they do have people there at the entrance of the reservation saying with the bikers that want to pass through and they're not allowing them, which is great. Um, well, that's where the governor was trying to exactly. force them to right. open that up. Definitely. And not let people, you know, it's ridiculous. Right. And it's just, it since it affects the um, the native people much more than the other people in South Dakota. Right. I mean, you know, they're putting our people at risk. Yes, you know, definitely. By having that whole rally, having the you know whole Sturgis thing, and yeah, and, and it's all for money. Of definitely, course, definitely, of course. Always. <laughs> yeah, and I and I was reading a poll that said sixty percent of the people that live in the surrounding area there in Sturgis and Bear Butte area they didn't want the rally. I this heard year. that. Yes. So you know, it's fascinating to to see that the rally is still going on. You know, so it's unfortunate. And, and then also people will be taking it back to their own community. Definitely. Because one, they're drinking, so they're not social distancing. Nope. And they don't have to wear masks. It's right. not required there. It's a state that does not require masks, right. just like Iowa. And, and then and I've heard some of the interviews, um, I, I want to say on the news, I don't want to say which news, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they talk about how, you know, they're interviewing people who say, well, I, I, it's just political. It's not, you know, it's right. not a real thing. You right. know, it, it's, uh, we're not going to get it over here. And, you know, just. No, I definitely have heard that too. You know, a lot of people are saying it's a, it's a hoax. It's not real. Um, it's definitely real. People are dying from it. You know, we see it each and every day and people just need to take it more seriously. Uh, I've had a lot of friends on Facebook who, who've thought the same thing, that it was a hoax and wasn't real, yet they turn around who've had a family member that has it, now they're believers. So we just all need to take it serious and do our part to combat it. Yeah, it's, it's a, a shame that we have to wait till somebody in your family actually has it or dies from it right. before we take it seriously. Yes, correct. And, and I, I do, you know, I think a lot of people are relaxing too much. Yeah. Um, you know, um, Tiny had the keep the people dancing, socially distance, right. uh, or what is it, the powwows, yes. and I thought that was great. Definitely. You know, it, because, you know, of course it's powwow season yes. and nothing could go on during that time because you couldn't have gatherings, um, that she had so many people involved from across the yes. nation. Definitely. And uh, so give a shout out to Tiny. Yes. Uh, on keep the people dancing and yes. I think she's still keeping them dancing which she is does. nice and it's nice to see people um, kids and just elders from across the country for sure not just here but of course what you do see at Powell's anyhow yes. so that's really nice 
And speaking of events and powwows, our American Indian Heritage Celebration. Yes. So we're not having that this year. No, no, we're not going to have it this year just for safety reasons. You know, that's a huge gathering that we have each year in Santa Clara County at the fairgrounds. And, you know, we get over about 3,000 people, you know, each year, I would say. And it's just, it's not worth it to take the risk in yeah. getting people sick and especially our elders. So hopefully we can continue it next year when they do have a vaccine and everything's fine. But for this year, we do need to cancel uh, that event and a lot of our other events that we have in the community too, so. Uh, one thing we had was, you know, every year we have National Night Out right. and we always uh, do it together. Yes. With the Indian Health Center and Conexion, but this year we had National Night In. Yes. So um, we're gonna end our show with showing a little bit of our National Night In where we were able to involve the community and we were socially distanced. So <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rose. And I want everyone to stay safe. Please wash your hands, use your sanitizer, and be sure and wear a mask. Wear a mask. It's so important. Keep your family safe, okay? My name is Kelly Gamboa. I'm a Mescalero Apache and a descendant of Tule River here in California. And I'm gonna sing a song today that is traditionally a love song. And it's also, it was sung to me as a child as a lullaby. And it's also a saying goodbye song.
Muchas gracias. Lazo Camati, stay safe. Feliz Dios.